One of the most embarrassing things that happens to me when I'm up here is when pages stick together. So I crinkle the pages to make sure they don't stick together. So I really crinkled them a lot this today. The crinkle stuck together. So we'll, we'll see how I get along here. We'll do the best we can, and the rest is up to God. On the night of Jesus' birth... The angels announced to the shepherds that the Messiah had been born. And so they, they went and visited that uh, place of his birth. And the Bible says they went away rejoicing and praising God. Now, I wonder, you know, you just, you're, use our imagination, if there was an alien that had come down in a flying saucer from outer space and been watching that night, could the alien have told that there's something different about this night, the way that the shepherds were acting? Sometime later, the Magi arrived, and they had traveled from the east, a long journey, and they, they found Jesus, and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they worshiped him. Here again, if, if aliens had been watching from uh, afar and, and seeing the travels, and, and when they found Jesus and worshiped him, could the aliens have told that something different happened? Something really important happened? Is something important happening this morning? Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? Is something so important happening this morning that has drawn you here? If, if you couldn't tell anybody why you were here, and if somebody was observing you, could they tell that something significant was going on in your life this morning? If an alien were watching you, what would the alien think? Now, I know it's not December, and this is not the Christmas series. I, I'm anxious for the Christmas series, but we're not going to start it just yet. But I use this to get your attention. I mean, Jesus' birth was really something important, right? Yeah, okay. His life was really something important, right? Yeah. All right. And his death was something really important, right? Yeah. And his death resurrection from the dead was something really important, right? Amen. So how important is this morning to you? Is this morning something really important to you? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, you hesitated, but I did break the chain there. See, worshiping him is important, and so this morning we're focusing on, why am I here? Ask yourself that question, why are you here? Why are you here today in this building, sitting where you are? You online, why are you there listening, watching online? And later on, if, if you're online and you're watching it or listening to it, why, why are you there? Why, why are you here with us? What is going on in your life that makes this moment so important? Why are you here? If, if an alien were watching you all week, could they tell that something important, vastly important was happening today in your life? Or would they just say, well, yeah, they went to the ball game the other night, they went to this, they went to that. This is just another thing, invent another event in their life. But how important is it? How much of your life is devoted to the one who brought you into this world? I ask these questions just to make us think. Why are we here? Now, I hope you're here to worship. I mean, worship is what we intend to be here for. Kelly had great songs. Okay, so I was gone part of the song service. But the, the, the first medley of songs was great. And then I, I, I came back in for the, for the communion song. And that was great. The worship songs. But what is worship? Do we even know? Well, a couple of weeks ago, we went to Merriam-Webster, and so let's do it again this morning. How does Merriam-Webster define worship? Well, first of all, most importantly, it defines it as a verb. 
A verb is an action word. It means we're doing something. So it's an action word, and they define worship as something that we is to show honor or reverence as a divine being of supernatural power. Are you here to show reverence for, for God? I, I like the section. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Have you ever worshipped extravagantly? Maybe not here, but have you worshipped any place at home? In the privacy of your home that you just got so caught up in worship that you just, it was extravagant and you knew it. Another definition of Webster is to perform or take part in worship or an act of worship. Well, that's, that's the easy one. That's the easiest one for all of us. Are those, any of those reasons why you're here this morning? I hope so. Does your life show it right now? If somebody that didn't know you were watching, could they tell that this morning was really something special for you? Who is he that we worship him? Why should we worship him? Well, he's the, the, he's the creator. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, and, and we see that he's the creator of everything. But he's also the sustainer of life. The breath you're taking right now, he gave it to you. There's so many things that God does. And, you know, we, I, I hope you're looking around these trees turning color. I mean, th this morning with the sun in the east, they were reflecting on the, the eastern side of the woods. And then this evening when it's in the west, it's going to be reflecting on the other side of the woods. It's going to be beautiful. Do we worship God for what he's done for us and everything? Now, so he's a sustainer of life. He gives us all this beauty. What is the purpose of this message? You know, every message has a purpose, but sometimes I don't bother telling you. You're just supposed to catch on to it. Well, the purpose of this message is so that we know that we're here to worship and glorify God. And we're going to expand on that as we go. The Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. Now, you have to understand, the church at Corinth was in a tough spot. Corinth was a crossroads of immorality. It's the Las Vegas, the San Francisco of the United States. Corinth was a, a nasty place to be, and so Paul, in his letter to that church, was addressing some of the issues they were having with the Christians weren't acting the way that they should with their eating and, and so forth. So, so this, just to get a reference as to what this verse is talking about, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. says, so, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, get that, whatever you do, do it to the glory of of God. So what is worship? Well, worship is glorifying God. Worship is glorifying God. It, it's not a one and done thing. It's an action word. And so worship is to be continuous and unending. Continuous and unending. Now, th this is where the church, this is where Christians have a major problem. Because we come to church, right? And we come to church to worship. But that's not exactly what God had in mind. See, worship is to be like a, a machine that works off of perpetual motion. You, you understand perpetual motion? Uh, a machine that produces enough energy of itself that it's able to keep going continually. And that's how our worship should be. We should love God and adore Him so much that our worship is perpetual motion. It's, it's continuing on and on and on. Sadly, our worship doesn't work like that, does it? We don't do that. We forget about God. We forget about worship. Yesterday, I was planting some hyacinth bulbs. I was enjoying myself. I forgot all about worshiping God. Peggy's in the backyard. She was doing things back here, and she, she was noticing the beauty around her. And I was oblivious. See, we, we, we forget about God many times. We, we forget about this perpetual, continual worship. Worship is something of God that we do not just once, not just on Sundays, not just occasionally, not only at set times of the day, morning, noon, and when we go to bed or whatever it is, our purpose in life is to glorify God, and, and Paul states that. 
Whatever you do, glorify God. But most of us, most Christians, view that we come to church to worship. And not only that, we don't view this part of the service as worship. We view the music part as worship, don't we? Come, let us sing and worship. It's a worship team. It's a worship time. We hardly ever view the teaching and preaching as worship, but it is. But it's, it's, it's more than that, though. If your view of worship is only Sunday morning and only of singing praises to God, maybe they're heartfelt, maybe they're, maybe they're extravagant and you just can't hardly sit in your seat. If that's your view of worship, you're missing a lot. You're missing out on what God really intends on in worship. Many people view the worship of God as occasional. That's, that's, that's not a way to survive healthy as a Christian. Uh, Craig Brian Larson tells a story of an event with whales that happened at Point Barrow, Alaska. Three whales got trapped in ice. The closest ice around them was five miles away, and there was this breathing hole that these whales somehow got trapped in that spot. And of course, then you've always got human beings coming to the rescue, right? So people got together, and the ice in the, in the sea was three or six inches thick. So they cut breathing holes every 20 yards apart and cut through the ice, broke it up, and made a breathing hole. And then somehow they coaxed these whales to the next breathing hole. Eight days of this. Finally, some Russian... Uh, ice breakers, ships came, and they, they broke it through the rest of the way. But in this process, only two of the whales made it. The one they presumed had drowned. Now, is that our view of worship? That Sunday morning is a, is a hole in the ice, and we come to worship God on Sunday morning until we get to the next Sunday morning? Until we get to the next Sunday morning? If that's your view of worship, you're missing it. That's not healthy worship. Remember, if you missed it in the story, only two of the three whales survived because the holes in the ice wasn't healthy. It was kind of like Band-Aids. Now, I don't mean to say that Sunday morning worship is a Band-Aid, but it, it does get us going to sustain us the rest of the week. And how many times do we skip Sunday morning? How many times do we take it too lightly? Worship is not just breathing hole to breathing hole. Worship is continual. Worship is something that we come to God for. You know, God does not provide worship for us so we could worship him. God does not provide the worship so we could worship him. It's, it's the other way around. We are to seek worshiping God to glorify him. We are to seek worshiping God to glorify him. It's on our part to seek God to worship him. Don't, don't, don't wait on God to provide the, the opportunity. We seek opportunities. Now, God does sometimes provide the opportunities for us. God does sometimes say, Kenny, you're struggling. Here's a breathing hole. And it's up to me to take it. So he does provide spaces of time, but then again, when he provides spaces of time, such as this morning, what are we doing with this time? Does your mind wander? Did you prepare for this morning? Did you stay up too late last night watching a football game like I used to do a lot? I've given up on Saturday night football because it's wrecked my Sunday morning worship so much, especially when you're the preacher and can't hardly stay awake for your own sermon. Do we prepare for Sunday morning? To, when God provides the opportunity to say, hey, Sunday morning, you're going to have a couple hours to worship. And what do we do with it? We just pilfer it away. Stay up too late. Or whatever we're doing, distracted. Drag ourselves out of bed on Sunday morning. You know when the hardest time for me to worship is? When I'm not doing something here at church. It is. I, I struggle to get to church on time. I, I've got a Sunday off and I can go someplace else. I sometimes tend to stay up too late. 
and have a hard time getting to church because I usually go to, this, to the late service so I can sleep in a little bit. But do we prepare for Sunday morning worship? I talked to one person this morning that did, and they had no clue what I was going to talk about this morning. They took a day of rest yesterday so they could make it here this morning. When is the last time we've actually done that? to actually prepare for Sunday morning worship, this, this breathing hole that God gives to us. Now, are there other ways to worship God? So, okay, so I've, I've, I've kind of built up Sunday morning, but I kind of knocked Sunday morning. But So are there other ways to worship God? So, so let's go back to that 1 Corinthians letter that Paul wrote. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever I do, it's all to be the glory of God. So do it all for God's glory. Now, the last fill in the blank that you had, it wasn't a complete sentence. I should have mentioned that. So here's the, here's the whole thing. We are to seek worshiping God to glorify him all the time, nonstop, nonstop. Now, just take time to read that statement. Contemplate on it. We are to seek worshiping God, to glorify Him all the time, non-stop. Is that even possible? Well, not the way that we live life, because we do it wrong. Daniel Taylor, in his book, Letters to My Children, his son Matthew asked him, uh, why do we need to go to church? He said, church is boring, Dad. And we've all been there, haven't we? We've all thought that. Well, Taylor, as a, as a wise father, answered his son in, in, in a way that his son could understand it. You see, Matthew had a pet hamster named Fluffy. And so Taylor explained to his son, he said, but you know, too many times we place God in a cage, the way that you place Fluffy in a cage. We place God in a cage so that we're free to do what we want to do. Don't have to worry about God. He's in a cage. We can maintain control of our lives or mess up our lives. We'll put it like that. Because God's in his cage. And in his cage, God won't bother us because we can ignore him. We can go about our lives, go about our business. And ever so often, we let God out of his cage so we can play with him, so that we can have him forgive us of our sins, so that we can, we can uh, help us a little here, help us a little there. And then when we're done, we put God back in his cage. And he explained to his son, he said, maybe the problem is you put God in a cage and you're not having him with you enough. Well, think about that silly, stupid illustration. But do we come to church on Sunday morning and get God out of the cage when we arrive? And we kind of cuddle and pet God? God, you're, you're so good. You're, you, and help us out. Get us through another week. Thank you for the last week. And then when we leave, we put him back in the cage again. Now, I know we don't think that we're doing that, but don't we? Don't we a lot of times? We put God in his cage. We pray a little bit before a meal. We pray when we get up or when we go to bed. We listen to Christian music, or maybe listen to a sermon on TV or social media. Maybe we read our Bibles a little bit. But we do it our way. And how much time does that add up to a day? Five hours? No. Oh, I can put five hours in worship God when I prepare a sermon on sermon day. Do we, do we worship God three hours a day? Do we have him on our mind for three hours? I doubt it. How about one hour? If, if we're honest, most of us hardly give him an hour. So we're, we're, we're caught up in life. We're caught up in what we do. And Satan distracts us from God so that we can get all bent out of shape or just forget about him and have fun. So, so how, how do we... God wants my worship all day long. Not just part of the day, all day. God wants your worship all day long. So how, how do we do it? Well, first of all, we are to we, we worship God by giving him what he wants and not what we want to give him. 
These are some little bit tougher points this morning. See, we worship God by giving him what he wants and not what we want to give him. Case in point. Marshall Shelley tells about the time early in his marriage that he got his wife an anniversary gift. So evidently they'd been married a year, a couple years. So what can he get his wonderful wife that she'd really appreciate? Well, he got her a rain gauge. Now, his logic was she grew up on the farm. He knew how much weather is important to farmers and farm daughters, so she would be excited about a rain gauge, right? No. He doesn't go into any detail, her reaction, except that she was not impressed. But isn't that what we do with God? Hey, God, I'm going to worship you this morning, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to read the Bible this morning, God, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you one chapter. And during that chapter, we can't hardly keep our minds on what we're doing because we want to move on with life. We're excited about what's coming next. Now, I'm not saying we do this all the time, but we've all been there, right? It's hard to focus on staying with God and worshiping Him the way that He wants us to worship Him instead of the way that we want to worship Him. And, and, and how do we learn how to worship God? Well, we've got to read the Bible. We've got to give Him time. We've, we've, got to, we've got to do the educational things. And with life, it comes to watch other people. And we see how to worship God, and then we do it the way that God wants us to worship, not the way that we want to worship. It means conforming oneself to God's ways and what God desires and not put God on the back burner. God wants all of us all the time. Worshiping God is all about God, not about us. So how do we worship him all the time? How do we worship God every day, every hour, every minute, and every second? Well, just for an example, we go to Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. What a really short verse. It said, pray continually. Now, those of you that know that verse know how that's done, but those of you that don't know that verse maybe don't know how it's done because you can say, I can't keep my eyes shut praying all the time. It's just impossible. Well, you, you read into the verse what Paul wants you to do. It's that always consciousness of God's presence. Always conscious of our need for God. Always conscious of our praise to God. Always conscious of thanking God for that breath. Always conscious of God and just being able to talk to him. Just, just like someone's here beside you at any time. All the time. Not shoving him off, not putting him in a cage. I, I like what the King James Version says. It says, pray without ceasing. I, you know, a lot of times King James got things complicated with these and thous, but I love the King James on this verse. Pray without ceasing, continually. In adoration and reverence, we worship God in all things and in all ways. And there's different ways of doing this. We worship God in our sorrows. You, you say, well, how, how can I do that? What, you, David did it. Read the Psalms. David continually is worshiping God in his sorrows, in his anguish, in his, in his anger, in, in, in just so many of his emotions. He pours his heart out to God. And if you notice, a lot of those chapters that he's, of the Psalms, he starts off in anguish. He starts off in kind of blasting God once in a while. And he ends up in praise and worship and thanking God by the end of the chapter. So we can praise God in our, in our sorrows. Example, uh, Psalm 31, Psalm 6, Psalm 22, Psalm 51. There's a whole bunch of them. And, and we can praise God in our joy. Of course, that's the easy one if we can remember to actually do it. We praise God in our sadness, the times that we're heartbroken and think our world has ended. We praise God in our, in our repentance when we sin and we come back to God. Yeah, David did that. I forget what, what chapter it is of Psalm, but there's a Psalm that he wrote after his sin with Bathsheba was brought to light by Nathan. We worship God in our fear. And you get the idea, no matter what our emotion, no matter what the situation, we can worship God. He wants us to worship him in everything. Whatever the emotional state, 
His heart and His arms are wide open for us to come to Him. Now, you, you, you might ask, well, well, how do we worship God all the time with every breath? Well, right now, take a breath. I know you're breathing, but I want you to be conscious of it. Take a deep breath. Just draw it in and let it out. And thank God for it. Last week, I lost a friend. He didn't know he was sick. I don't know how he died, but it, I assume a heart attack. He didn't know his last breath was coming. And I know where he is today. He's, he's with Jesus. But he had no idea that that was his last breath. And you and I have no idea when our last breath is. So we've got life. We enjoy life. So be conscious. Just thank God for that breath that you just took. That's the reality of how we live. Worship God in everything. Worship God in the shower. Now, a lot of you like to sing in the shower. At least we talk about singing in the shower. It's a place that we can just beller it out. Sing to God in the shower. Give Him the praise and honor and glory. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I know this is kind of gross, but yeah, it, it, it's something that I realized years ago. You know, we, we, we like to worship God when we're dressed nice or when we got all our clothes on or whatever. You know, shower, we're not going to do that. But yeah, have you ever been so sick you didn't know which end it was coming out? You're just, you're just almost better to die. You're that sick. You worship God. You cry out to God. Say, God, help me. I am so sick. I can't hardly stand up. I can't hardly move I'm, I'm so deathly sick that's worship that's giving God the glory and asking him begging him to help you we worship God in our work we worship God in our play we worship God waking up and going to sleep we worship God when we're watching a sports game that's a good time to worship God sometimes when we're not like what's going on in the game give God the glory see basically the only time you cannot worship God is when you're sinning that's the only time you can't do it. But all the other time, you can worship God and do so. And we, we don't do very well. You know, it'd be nice if our attitude of God was as a puppy's attitude is of you. Remember, you, you bought the puppy, or you got the puppy, and, and the, you, you've had it for a few weeks, and the puppy just loves you and adores you, and so you're gone to school, you're gone to, to work, or you went to town, you come home, and that puppy just, bouncing up to you, just bouncing up and down, the tongue's hanging out. It just loves you so much. Wouldn't it be nice if that was our attitude of God? We just couldn't wait to be with Him, that he, He's here, or we're here on Sunday morning, or wherever it is that we love God so much, and we want to be with Him so much. Sadly, that's not it. That's Satan blocking our attitude. You know, we want to go to heaven, right? I mean, that's why you're here. And we're, when we're in heaven, we're going to worship God all the time. Now, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I, I do have an idea what Apostle John writes in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. He gives us a, a glimpse, at least of one moment in heaven. So let's read that. Revelation 7, starting with verse 9. He writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels, get that word, all the angels. We're standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen! Wow! Endless, countless, Numbers of people and angels. 
the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, at the end of the time, he says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. It's going to be grand if you're in Jesus. And it's going to be the most scary, deathly thing in your life if you're not with him. At that time, when Jesus returns, nothing else is going to matter. Andy Crouch tells a story about his friend David, who was dying of cancer. David was a professional photographer, world-renowned. People around the world knew of this guy's photography ability. So you can imagine the electronic cameras that they have nowadays and the developing, not the developing, but the, the editing equipment, all this stuff that, you, that, that a professional photographer would know what he's doing to create these beautiful masterpiece of photos to enhance them. But David was dying. And at that time, Andy Cross tells about that his friends and family were gathered around him. And one of his friends brought, brought a guitar and sang Rat, Matt Redmond's song, 10,000 Reasons. It was, a, it was a time of worship and looking to God. David was surrounded by family and friends worshiping God. Nothing else mattered. All those pretty pictures, all of his electronic equipment, nothing mattered. Because his mind had been cleared out of all the clutter of the world, and he worshiped God to the time of his death. To enter from this life into the arms of Jesus. Where are you at? Can we get rid of the clutter in our life? Can we get rid of the distractions? All these things that they're great. I mean, God blesses us with, and then Satan uses us to keep us distracted. Can we truly set this all aside and worship God? That's not only why you're here. That's why you exist, to glorify God. Let's glorify God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so distracted. The blessings that you give us distract us. Not that you're at fault, but Satan, Satan uses those against us. And of course, we get distracted on our own. We say, we, we shove you in a cage. Well, Father, help us to bring you out of the cage that we put you in. And not set you on a pedestal, but bring you into our lives, to be part of our lives, us and you, you and us, father and child, child and father. Father, help us to glorify you. Glorify Jesus Christ. And you've given us the Holy Spirit if we're Christians so that you help us to glorify you. You give us the opportunities. Help us not to waste them. Help us to truly love you beyond what we can do on ourselves. We, we need you to help us to glorify you. We love you, Father. Help us to love you more and trust in you. It's in Jesus Christ, your Son's name we pray and give thanks. Amen.